So Bob tried for four or five years to get this book sold. And I would have these telephone conversations with him where he would say, so Steve, I sat down with New American Library this morning. They really like it. There's only one problem. And I said, what's that? He said, they don't know how to market this. And I said, why not? He said, because they don't know who these bomb squad guys are. If you can change these guys to Navy SEALs, they'll pick the book up. <laughs> I said, Bob, and he would go, by the third or fourth time this happened, he would go, I know. I'd say, Bob, that's the whole point. You've got to find one of these guys and say, dude, there once was the first Navy SEAL book. This is the first Navy EOD book, right? So the, uh, even after 9-11, I was surprised that that had, had occurred. So Bob and I parted ways amicably, and I then decided to go this independent route. And I said to myself, how am I going to decide which of these print-on-demand firms, by this time I've heard of this concept of print-on-demand, which of these am I going to go with? And I started first by going on the internet, looking at their websites, trying to figure out which ones I thought looked to be the most professional. And among the things that I looked at was, I wanted to make sure that they had decent distribution. Uh, a lot of them advertised and said, we are available on Amazon.com, on BarnesandNoble.com, on uh, Books a Million and the like. And so I would go into their catalogs on their websites, because most of these places you can buy directly from their website. And then I would go on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com and see how was the book doing there, how was it presented, was it getting reviewed a lot. That told me if they were not just being posted there, but are they actually seeing sales. And so there were a couple of firms that were emerging that that was happening. Ex Libris happened to be one of them. I also decided that I was going to purchase a couple of the books to see what the quality was. I didn't want the book to be physically of poor quality. And so of those that I purchased, Ex Libris happened to be uh, one of the ones that was of high quality. And uh, in fact, a couple of times when I've taken it to local bookstores and said, would you be interested in carrying it? On more than one occasion, I had them say, I have seen print-on-demand books in the past, and this book does not look like a print-on-demand book. It looks like a high-quality book. I, I now think that print-on-demand and high-quality go hand-in-hand, but at the time, I think there were still some, published, some, some publishers that were, that were not necessarily printing higher-quality higher stuff. Um, at the time, uh, Exlibris was a subsidiary of Random House, and they were advertising on their website that if you did so well with the book, they would pick it up. Um, I was saying to Doug earlier today, I, I think they were owned by Random House, um, I think they got sold to Penguin, and now I think Penguin is owned by Random House, or vice versa. So I think it's one of these where Exlibris has moved around, and I think this happens with these publishing firms, is that they get moved and bought out and the name changed or what have you. But so they are still, I like that aspect of that they were still being connected with a major uh, firm. And then they're distributed through um, Lightning Source, and I've also heard it called Ingram. I don't know, I think they're pretty much one and the same in effect. So that helps because I know that it's part of the catalog. And this is one of these guilty pleasures in life. You go to Barnes and Nobles, you type up on the thing, boom, your book comes up on the computer there. Okay, they're still available here. I was told by someone, by the way, I don't know if you guys have heard this technique, is you get your friends throughout the country to order your book at all the Barnes & Noble, and if somebody orders one, they'll bring in two. And then you tell them, and don't go pick it up. Now your book, there's two copies of your book on the shelf. Somebody comes in and buys those two copies, they will order two more. That's one of the ways how you get your, you start to move your book outside. I don't know if you've heard that one, so. Um, so, uh, the book proximity did fairly well. Um, so as I said, website was most professional, verified that it was uh, distributed, uh, etc., and it started to move. And one of the things that I did, and I connected in with the Military Writers Society, I submitted it for uh, one of their contests. It garnered the gold medal for Navy fiction in 2008. So now I felt that you know I, I was I was doing okay. It's a print-on-demand book, but what's interesting is. I am sure that most of you here are aware of print on demand, the difference between traditional publisher, self publishing, and print on demand, and the like. Most people, I think, don't understand that level of, of publishing, and to them it doesn't matter. If they like the book, they'll pick it up and they'll buy it. So then in 2010, uh, I decided to put it out as an ebook. And the ebook world thing was just starting, and I found this company called Ebook Architects. Young guy started doing it on his own, sort of for small scale out of his garage, and now he's got this huge company, his name is Joshua Talent, and he is now printing ebooks not just for individuals, 
but he also does it for publishing firms. And that's another thing that I've found is a lot of publishing firms now aren't really doing their own ebook. It's they have hired somebody to do their ebook stuff for them. And so Josh, uh, for 410 bucks, he would make my manuscript, and it was based on the size of the manuscript. He would make my manuscript available for Google, iTunes, Smashwords, uh, the Kindle, all of the associated ebook formats. And so I did that. So now the book was published in 2007 as a um, through Ex Libris, published, self-published as an ebook by myself. So in, on the Kindle and Amazon, it said by Stephen Phillips, not by Ex Libris. Because Ex Libris at the time, I think they do ebooks now, at the time they still didn't do ebooks. So I, in effect, self-published it as an ebook. Uh, another thing that I did, some of you may be aware of, is over time I found it was not moving on iTunes, it was not moving on the Google Books, but it was moving pretty well on uh, Amazon. It was not moving very much on the Barnes and Noble for the Nook. And Amazon now has a thing called um, Amazon Select where you can, if you list your book solely with Amazon, they give you uh, better rights. And I want to say it's either 25% or 30% of the royalty. No, I'm sorry, it's 70% of the royalties. They get 30, I get 70. It's distributed internationally. The book is in India, Canada, the UK. Uh, Italy, Spain. I always find this interesting, by the way, because I go on my thing and I look how many books I've sold. Four books were sold in Spain last month. And I'm like, who in Spain is buying? And I try to say, is there an American that's living in Spain that is using the Spanish thing? I don't know. There it is. So, uh, so that ebook journey was, um, was pretty interesting. Another aspect of it is, is they have not only the 70% royalties, they have five promotions per quarter. And they have different kinds of promotions. My favorite one is the free promotion. Maybe some of you have heard of this. So the way the free book promotion is, and I've really cracked the code on this one. So what you do is you wait for like a Sunday after a holiday. So like the Sunday after Easter, or, the, or Easter, I will do this because Easter is a Sunday. Um, I will make the book free that day because a lot of folks will get a Kindle right before they go on a trip, or they'll get a Kindle on their birthday party over the weekend. So I make it free on Sunday, and when you do that, the book's ranking goes up. In, it, it's in a separate category, it's in a free category, but its ranking goes up in the free category. So if I do that, by Sunday night, my book will be number one free book. It'll be me and Leo Tol Tolstoy, right? I'm not making this up. Now the next day, when it clicks over to a sold book, the rank is still high. So now it gets seen more often by people, and I'll enjoy success for a couple of days. Is it because, just because it's seen by more people, it'll get bought by more folks. A second technique that this is uh, my opinion about pricing the book, because it's self-published, I get to price the book um, in the ebook world, is um, I have chosen a price point of $9.99. And here's why. I tried all of them. I tried $1.99, $2.99, $3.99, and uh, it moves at the same volume, no matter what my price point is, up until about $9.99. You go much higher than $9.99, the sales start to drop. And since the volume is moving in each one of those, pragmatically, I put it at $9.99 for the higher royalties, right? Now, I think it's a different buyer at each of those price points. I think at $1.99, somebody doesn't even look that much. Trucks are sold ah, looks like a good book, fast, faster, fast, 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 okay, I'll buy that. I think at $9.99, someone may be a little bit more discerning, but it has 60 reviews. It's a 4.5 ranking with 60 reviews on there. And there's some folks that spent time writing detailed, thorough reviews on it. If you do another cursory look, you'll see I, I have my pictures on there. You see that I've written another book. So I think when you put all those things together to an audience, somebody who's shopping, and by the way, I do believe in judge a book by its cover. That's another thing. I think they see all that package together, and they, they pull it out, and they decide to do it. So I'm going to segue for a moment on a book by its cover. When I put out Proximity at the time, the photograph on the cover, maybe EOD tech, I made sure it was EOD tech, not a steel, not a marine, fast roving out of a helicopter. That it was rare that you saw novels, fiction, with a photo on the cover. It was usually art. The only time that you saw a photo was normally if it was a photo from a movie, and it would be a photo of a shot of the movie with the famous actors and everything else. But I decided to go with that regardless. Um, I tried art. I had a couple people do stuff. I had a guy paint a bomb disposal guy for me. None of it worked. I really liked that photograph. Again, with my editing team and friends, I sent out several Navy photographs, high quality Navy photographs, of EOD technicians doing different things that are also replicated in the book. I wanted to make sure 
What was ever on the cover was replicated in the book. So this, I'm coming back to the, you do judge a book by its cover. My mom said it best. When we looked at all these guys diving, things blowing up, whatever, she said, Steve, I like this picture, and here's why. The guy's fast roping out of a helicopter. He's all by himself. You can't see his face. You can't see where he's going. There's no deck below him. There's no ground below him. And she said, I don't know what's going on, but I know it's, it's going to be something bad. It's going to be something cool. And the other thing that she said to me, and you know what else? She said, people buy books online these days. And so think about this. They're going to look. The cover of your book is a thumbnail on the internet. And that picture has a nice silhouette. If somebody sees it on the internet in a small size, they can tell it's a guy fast ripping out of a helicopter. So I give my mom a lot of credit. She, she helped me to, just, to nail down and decide that one was in the So I think it works. Um, so it enjoyed success. It got a gold medal. I got a positive re review from the U.S. Naval Institute. And when they picked it up and reviewed it, I was overjoyed. I thought that, that was fantastic when it was reviewed in uh, proceedings. It got a lot of uh, positive reviews in, uh, on Amazon. And with all of this, so then I said to myself, so I want to try to make that leap to take this book from being a print-on-demand book to being published with a traditional publisher. So I approached the Naval Institute Press, and I said, here's the deal. I've done this book. It did well. You yourselves have reviewed it. Would you be interested in, in picking it up? And uh, they said, uh, we'd like you to demonstrate to us what your sales were. And I printed out the sheet for them to date, just how many I've sold and everything like that. And they said, so you've saturated the market. They said, you have done just as well or better than we have. And they said, we're sorry, but, uh, you know. But then, of course, the next words were, and what else do you have? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I pitched them the recipient sign, which I was working on at the time. And they said, OK, we'll go with the recipient sign. So again, this is my view, of, my first view of the traditional publishing world. I'm pitching the story, and I'm thinking I'm telling this romantic story about this midshipman and his dad and these struggles with his whole thing. And is he going to graduate or not? And Rick Russell, the, uh, the editor of the press that I was working with, we get through all that. And his first question to me was, so how many words do you have? And I said, I'm at like 55,000 words right now. And he said, so we need at least 65,000 words so that we could put it in hard code. And he said, it would be better if it was closer to 100,000. Can you get there? And I said, well, that, I said, proximity was 98,000. I said, I think I can get it there. Why? And he said, so believe it or not, we are stipulated by the size of the book and the size of the bookshelves. He said, the, the physical size of the hardcover book now is being driven by the shelf size, the height of the shelf. And then also by the width of the spine and how much the words are. These are this is what's driving the, the, them, the, them first. Don't misunderstand me. They want to have a good book. They want to be well represented. They want to represent and to publish good books. But I just found that curious that that was a driving, that was sort of his first thing of, hey, if you're not, if you don't even think you can get this thing to at least 65,000 words, we're going to start thinking about another, you know, another path or something like that. So, so they decided, uh, they decided to do that. And, uh, and they picked it up. And uh, another thing that I learned along the way that was interesting is, so I was told that it was going to be spring of 2012. Later on, it ended up being published in the fall of 2012. So they moved it to the right. So a story that I have heard more than once, and just because I read it on the internet doesn't mean it's not true, <laughs> that I've shared with Doug in the past is, I've heard stories of folks getting picked up by traditional publishers, the traditional publisher owns the book, and not unlike a film company, decides this book, oh, we're going to push you off to a later catalog. Sorry. Oh, not one more year. Ah, oh, this is really better for the Christmas season. Next thing you know, an author's book has been sitting someplace three and four years and hasn't been published. So I got a little bit nervous when that started to happen, but in the long run, they, they really did just push it back one catalog to the fall of 2012. So I thought I'd, uh, I'll shift gears a little bit and talk go back a little bit into what I was uh, describing about writing and, uh, and sort of how I, I build out my stories. So the first thing in both of these books, and I'm doing this now, I have two other books, I have a nonfiction I'm working on, and it's a little bit, it's interesting, it's easier to write nonfiction, I think, because the story's already there, you're just figuring out how to package it. I do think that writing fiction is a little bit more difficult, you certainly have more freedom. Um, so the first thing that I try to do is I think about what are the themes that I want to convey to the audience, right? 
So I think about themes of, um, you know, and for the recipient side, I wanted to have themes of honor, I wanted to have themes of tradition, I wanted to have themes of ethics and leadership. I wanted the reader to compare and contrast different leadership styles. For the EOD book, I wanted among the themes to be sort of the excitement of all of the different things that an EOD technician does. And one of the big things that I wanted to say is, so a lot of folks think about this as, so yes, it's exciting to parachute out of a plane, a fast road, to navigate through the jungle, but all of that is just to get to the IED. That's just to get to the device in the first place. That's where the real danger is. That's where the real challenge is. And so then I start after that, I'm a storyboarder. And I think I start to think almost like a filmmaker. I start to think about what are the scenes that I would want to have in order to express this story. And some of them have to be, in some ways, traditional and iconic. In this case, when I'm giving a military story where I want to introduce somebody to a world that does exist, I almost have to build those iconics. So for example, in writing the, the proximity, I sat down and I said to myself, so I have, have to have an improvised explosive device to see. I have to have a C-mine scene. I have to have guys fast roping. I figured out, and so then I said, so how do I do that and make it congruent that, it, that it's laid out? Similarly, to the, in the recipient side, I said things like, so I want to talk about sailing. I want to talk about what it's like to go out in town at the Naval Academy. Uh, ironically, there's very little about being in class, and I don't know if that says something about me or not, but I've had more folks point out, they were like, were you not a very good student? I said, no, I wasn't. You don't write anything about being in class at the Naval Academy. So then I form these scenarios that I think will make that story clear, and then I formulate the plot arc to, that, that I think will drive that story. So as, again, in the case of um, the recipient's son, it's the plot arc of this midshipman who's struggling with the notion of he might get kicked out. He's accused of harassment, he might get kicked out, and he has to sort of defend himself. And then in proximity is finding the bad guys, getting to the device before they blow it up, and then the whole thing of the FBI trying to figure out who are these guys operating overseas, operating in the US, etc. And then as I write the scenes, I build the characters as I do that, and I really try to decide again, how many of them am I going to put the audience with and put you into their thoughts and make you identify with them, and how many of them maybe you're just supporting characters that might only be you know, two-dimensional. And because uh, I think there, you have to have a nice balance in doing that. I myself, when I've read, I'll get frustrated where I'll start to get into a character and I get part way through the book and I'll say, so where did this guy go? He's, you know, he's gone. I'm also, I find it better if there is more than one character in a book that you can identify with. I'm sure you've all done this. I've read books where you're basically like a bird on the shoulder of the main character, but you don't know anything about anybody else. So I like to make more than one character, each of them have a little bit of depth. When I do my own editing, then I, I review the manuscript sort of front to back and reread it over and over again, and I do it with Chicago Manual style. I try to verify consistency in the story and make sure that the characters remain recognizable. I was sharing with somebody earlier today, and thank goodness for the ability to do word search in Microsoft Word, and you can do it in Adobe and other things, I suppose, too. I want to make sure that the characters seem the same from, like maybe I've taken two years to write this thing. I want to make sure that the characters are consistent front to back in the story. So I'll take the FBI agent in proximity is Elena Cruz. I would take Elena Cruz and search Elena, and I would go through and reread her sections of the book front to back just by themselves to make sure that she's using the same idioms, her language sounds the same, her dress is the same. Certainly the characters go through their own personal journeys, but by the same token, you have to make sure that it seems like it's the same person front to back. So I do that. I try to discern the flow of the story and ensure the right amount of detail. Um, one of the things that I, I try, I want to make sure that I give, I, I have this rule for myself, I don't write anything by accident. There's, there's everything in the book is on purpose. And I've had people, I've challenged folks, I've said, show me where, the, I show you where this is important, or where this scene is supportive for some reason. So I'm going to say something that's heresy, maybe we should turn the tapes off, I don't know. J.K. Rowling writes a lot of stuff in her books that has nothing to do with the story. And I used to get frustrated in reading it, and I was like, are they paying her by the word? What's the deal? She has a lot in those stories that do not support the overall central part of the story. And it's almost as if there's too much fluff. This is what my wife says. My wife says, you've made the mistake of you're sitting down and reading this book front to bottom for, or top to bottom or whatever it enjoyed you. She said, the book is intended to be for a mom to sit down and read her kids at night, chapter by chapter, section by section. And that's why. 
There's all this stuff that's extra things that he doesn't say. But, so there it is. That's my style. Um, next, I go through and look at the grammar, the punctuation, the voice, and then as I described uh, previously, I go through all of the things to try to make sure that, um, uh, that, the, that the audience is picking up what I'm putting down, that all my editors have a, a decent understanding of it. So for marketing, uh, so writing is not my job. Writing is something that I, I do. Uh, it's more than a hobby, um, but it's not my main job. My main job, I work at Johns Hopkins University at the Applied Physics Lab. I hope that this becomes my job someday. I hope this, or this becomes something that I'm able to do full time. Uh, so like all writers, no matter what your level is, you do have to worry about marketing. So right now, my skills or my ability is to, to garner um, marketing mostly through review. Uh, if you get positive reviews, I'm amazed out there how folks, uh, there's bloggers out there that people follow that if you get them their, your book. There's a blogger called Navy Fiction that a lot of people follow, and when she writes reviews, people pick it up and, and, and read it. Um, reviews on Amazon, reviews on Barnes & Noble, I think that there's a lot of folks who do, if you're not in a brick and mortar bookstore, you trust what the rating is online, I would submit. Uh, I have done interviews, uh, radio interviews, and they're a really nice way and a fun way to showcase your work, but what I have never been able to do is connect an interview with a subsequent sale afterwards. I naturally I go and I look, but I have never been able to demonstrate to myself that because I had this interview, uh, that happened. But there's a really nice technique that I do like from that, though, and that is, uh, some of you may or may not be aware, there's a lot of these online radio programs now. Um, I think there's a, a block spot radio is one of them. There's a guy up there who's a retired Navy guy that has an online stream name with Commander Salamander. He has a very large following. He has a blog and he has a radio show every Sunday night. And this guy gets heavy hitters on his uh, blog. And heavy hitters come to his uh, radio show. And I'm not trying to say that about myself. but So as an example, I've been on his show twice. Um, one time I was on, I followed Kurt Lippold, the CEO of USS Cole. So he was the first half hour, I was the second half hour talking about proximity. And because they record the show and they put it online, it's there forever. And so now what's a nice thing to do is whenever folks ask me about my book or whenever I want to do any marketing, I can point them to that radio show and I say, jump into this radio show at 34 minutes and 34 seconds and you're going to hear 30 minutes of me talking about my book. So that's a nice thing. It's interesting, I also use that with the young folks who are interested in the EOD community. I'll say, hey, read this book about the EOD community, but then also go and listen to this radio show and you'll hear me talk about what life is like as an EOD technician. I, it's interesting, I, I like to share this story. I achieved that goal with proximity of it becoming sort of a recruiting tool for the US Navy for EOD technicians. And what I found was the commanding officer of EOD Moving the Lead started buying copies of it and handing it to kids who were interested in the EOD. When Facebook came out shortly thereafter, I had a guy, and I set up a Facebook page of, you know, my proximity is a Facebook page, the recipient son, I have one that's just my name, Officer Steve Phillips. Uh, I had a sailor that sent me a Facebook email, introduction thing, friended me, or tried to friend me, asked to be a friend, sent me this Facebook email. And he said, uh, he said, sir, he said, I want you to know that, uh, this is in the email, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the email, he basically says, I was in EOD school. I was partway through, I failed two tests, I got kicked out of EOD school, I got sent back to the fleet, I still wanted to be an EOD technician. I realized that the reason I fell out of school was that I was never really a strong student, I was never really a strong reader, and so what I needed to do was work on my reading so that I could become a better student. So since reading was my goal, I went onto Amazon.com and I searched EOD book, and yours was the first one that came up. So I bought Proximity, I'm not making this up, this is what he said, I used your book to teach myself how to read again. And now I'm two weeks from graduating, because he got back into the schoolhouse, and I want to thank you because you've changed my life. I printed that email out, I put it in one of those plastic sleeves and put it on my court board, and whenever I have a bad day, I say that. So I may never be Tom Clancy, I may never be Stephen King, but for me that was the feedback as a writer that, that I wanted to have. So. Uh, book signings, ironically, I will do a book signing here tonight and folks can go back and my dad will help. Hopefully we can overcome the issue with the square thing. I've got one of those credit card readers, happy to sell and sign books. Ironically, uh, I consider those to be advertising and not revenue. Uh, I'm not sure what your all's experiences are with book signings and the like. I lose money on them, basically. 
And so I, when I first did it, I realized, so first, in selling any book, let me back up two steps and say, again, clearly this is not my day job. This is, you know, something that I do for fun and enjoyment. I realize that, that you're not going to garner that much, but, so what I, what I have found is that, in effect, these, these become advertisement, not revenue. The online presence is something, though, that I do use to try to connect with readers. So here's what's interesting about the online presence. So the radio interviews, I don't know how well they work. Um, I do think the reviews on Amazon help. So I do have a blog, I do have Facebook, and every time I write a blog, uh, one of the things that I tend to do is I write on only a small amount of subjects. So some of you here might be bloggers. This is my opinion. If you don't agree with it, that, that's fine. Some of the bloggers that I start, first started following, folks, they take an editorial of the day, they repost it, they put their two sentences on, and they move on. And they post every single day, and they might post interesting things. But I, in following those folks, started to say, yeah, but I want to hear what you have to say more than just that, more than just analyzing what somebody else did. So I decided as I started to blog, when I, I write very rarely, but when I write, I write something. And when I write it, it's in the realm of uh, my experience. So I have written blogs about writing. I've written blogs that are book reviews, and my book reviews tend to be book reviews of um, military books or EOD books. And then uh, I will write about serving in the US Navy, I'll write about the Naval Academy, so it's sort of my center of mass. But then when I do that, every single time I do it, I put in the meta tags of EOD, Stephen Phillips, US Navy, US Naval Academy, so that if you go on Google and search US Navy EOD, cover of my book comes up, my picture comes up, my blog comes up, my Facebook page comes up. And so as a result, when folks are searching for EOD books, that's how they find me. So that is what I, I recommend right now, especially for the kids in the younger generation. You know, if you want to connect with them, that's what you do. Put yourself out there, have a blog, be serious about it, put those meta tags in, and you can get connected. Having said all that, I do also realize that my, for my own marketing, I have a niche audience, right? Mine is military enthusiasts, Naval Academy folks, EOD folks. And so what I try to do also is be true and remain, you know, focused.